Chapter sixty three of David Copperfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tig Hines. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter sixty three. A visitor. What I have purposed to record is nearly finished, but there is yet an incident conspicuous in my memory on which it often rests with delight, and without which one thread of the web I have spun would have a ravelled end. I had advanced in fame and fortune, my domestic joy was perfect, I had been married ten happy years. Agnes and I were sitting by the fire in our house in London one night in spring, and three of our children were playing in the same room, when I was told that a stranger wished to see me. He had been asked if he came on business, and had answered no, that he had come for the pleasure of seeing me, and had come a long way. He was an old man, my servant said, and looked like a farmer. As this sounded mysterious to the children, and moreover was like the beginning of a favourite story Agnes used to tell them, introductory to the arrival of a wicked old fairy in a cloak who hated everybody, it produced some commotion. One of our boys laid his head on his mother's lap to be out of harm's way, and little Agnes, our eldest child, left a doll in a chair to represent her, and thrust out her little heap of golden curls from between the window curtains to see what happened next. "'Let him come in here.' said I. There soon appeared, pausing in the dark doorway as he entered, a hale grey-haired old man. Little Agnes, attracted by his looks, had run to bring him in, and I had not yet clearly seen his face, when my wife, starting up, cried out to me in a pleased and agitated voice that it was Mr. Peggotty. It was Mr. Peggotty, an old man now, but in a ruddy, hearty, strong old age. When our first emotion was over, and he sat before the fire with the children on his knees, and the blaze shining on his face, he looked to me as vigorous and robust, with all as handsome, an old man as ever I had seen. "'Master Davy,' he said, and the old name in the old tone fell so naturally on my ear. "'Master Davy, tis a joyful hour as I see you once more, long with your own true wife.' "'A joyful hour indeed, old friend.' cried I. "'And these here pretty ones,' said Mr. Peggotty, "'to look at these here flowers. Why, Master Davy, you was but the height of the littlest of these when I first see you, when Emily warn't no bigger, and our poor lad were but a lad.' "'Time has changed me more than it has changed you since then,' said I. "'But let these dear rogues go to bed, and as no house in England but this must hold you, tell me where to send for your luggage. Is the old black bag among it?' that went so far, I wonder. And then over a glass of Yarmouth grog we will have the tidings of ten years. "'Are you alone?' asked Agnes. "'Yes, ma'am,' he said, kissing her hand. "'Quite alone.' We sat him between us, not knowing how to give him welcome enough, and as I began to listen to his old familiar voice, I could have fancied he was still pursuing his long journey in search of his darling niece. "'It's a mort of water,' said Mr. Peggotty, "'for to come across and only stay a matter of four weeks. "'But water, especially when tis salt, comes natural to me, "'and friends is dear, and I am here.' "'Which is verse,' said Mr. Peggotty, surprised to find it out, "'though I hadn't such intentions.' "'Are you going back those many thousand miles so soon?' asked Agnes. "'Yes, ma'am.' he returned. I give the promise to Emily afore I come away. You see, I doin't grow younger as the years comes round, and if I hadn't sailed as twas, most likely I shouldn't never have done't. And it's always been on my mind as I must come and see Master Davy and your own sweet bloomin' self in your wedded happiness afore I got to be too old. He looked at us as if he could never feast his eyes on us sufficiently. Agnes laughingly put back some scattered locks of his grey hair that he might see us better. "'And now tell us,' said I, "'everything relating to your fortunes.' "'Our fortunes, Master Davy,' he rejoined, "'is soon told. We haven't fared no house but fair to thrive. We've all us thrived. We've worked as we ought to, and maybe we lived a little hard at first or so, but we all us thrived.' What with sheep farming, and what with stock farming, and what with one thing and what with t'other, we are as well to do as well could be. There's been kinder a blessing fell upon us, said Mr. Peggotty, reverentially inclining his head, and we've done nought but prosper. That is, in the long run. If not yesterday, why then today? If not today, why then tomorrow? And Emily, said Agnes and I both together, 
"'Emily,' said he, "'after you left her, ma'am, "'and I never heard her saying of her prayers at night "'to her side of the canvas screen when we was settled in the bush, "'but what I heard your name. "'And after she and me lost sight of Master Davy, "'that there shining sundown, "'was that low at first, "'that if she had known then what Master Davy kept from us so kind and thoughtful, "'tis my opinion she'd have drooped away. "'But there were some poor folks aboard as had illness among em, "'and she took care of em and there was children in our company and she took care of them and so she got to be busy and to be doing good and that helped her when did she first hear of it i asked i kept it from her after i heard on it said mr peggotty going on nigh a year we was living then in a solitary place but among the beautifulest trees and with the roses a covering our being to the roof there come along one day when i was out a working on the land a traveller from our own norfolk or suffolk in england i don't really know which and of course we took him in and give him to eat and drink and made him welcome we all do that all the colony over he got an old newspaper with him and some other account in print of the storm that's how she'd knowed it when i came home at night i found she'd knowed it he dropped his voice as he said these words, and the gravity I so well remembered overspread his face. "'Did it change her much?' we asked. "'Ah, for a good long time,' he said, shaking his head, "'if not to this present hour. But I think the solitude done her good, and she had a deal to mind in the way of poultry and the like, and minded of it, and come through. I wonder,' he said thoughtfully, "'if you could see my Emily now, Master Davy, whether you'd know her.' is she so altered i inquired i do it no i see her every day and do it no but odd times i have thought so a slight figure said mr peggotty looking at the fire kind of worn soft sorrowful blue eyes a delicate face a pretty head leaning a little down a quiet voice and way timid almost that's emily we silently observed him as he sat still looking at the fire some thinks he said as her affection was ill bestowed some as her marriage was broken off by death no one knows how tis she might have married well and more to times but uncle she says to me that's gone for ever cheerful along with me retired when others is by fond of going any distance for to teach a child or for to tend a sick person or for to do some kindness towards a young girl's wedding and she's done a many but she has never seen one fondly loving of her uncle patient liked by young and old sought out by all that has any trouble that's emily he drew his hand across his face and with a half suppressed sigh looked up from the fire is martha with you yet i asked martha he replied got married master davy in the second year a young man a farm labourer as come by us on his way to market with his master's drays a journey of over five hundred miles there and back made offers for to take her for his wife wives is very scarce there and then to set up for their two selves in the bush she spoke to me for to tell him her true story i did they was married and they lived four hundred miles away from any voices but their own and the singing birds mrs gummidge i suggested it was a pleasant key to touch for mr peggotty suddenly burst into a roar of laughter and rubbed his hands up and down his legs as he had been accustomed to do when he enjoyed himself in a long shipwrecked boat would you believe it he said why someone even made offer for to marry her if a ship's cook that was turning settler master davy didn't make offers for to marry mrs gummidge i'm i'm gormed and i can't say no fairer than that i never saw agnes laugh so this sudden ecstasy on the part of mr peggotty was so delightful to her that she could not leave off laughing and the more she laughed the more she made me laugh and the greater mr peggotty's ecstasy became and the more he rubbed his legs and what did mrs gummidge say i asked when i was grave enough if you'll believe me returned mr peggotty mrs gummidge said of saying thank you i'm much obliged to you i ain't a-going for to change my condition at my time of life up with a bucket that was standing by and laid it over that there ship's cook's head till he sung out for help and i went in and rescued of him mr peggotty burst into a great roar of laughter and agnes and i both kept him company 
"'But I must say this for a good creature,' he resumed, wiping his face when we were quite exhausted. "'She has been all she said she'd be to us, and more. "'She's the willingest, the truest, the honestest helping woman, Master Davy, "'as ever drew the breath of life. "'I have never known her to be lone and lorn for a single minute, "'not even when the colony was all afore us, and we was new to it. "'And thinking of the old one is a thing she'd never done, "'I do assure you, since she left England.' now last not least mr micawber said i he has paid off every obligation he incurred here even to traddles's bill you remember my dear agnes and therefore we may take it for granted that he is doing well but what is the latest news of him mr peggotty with a smile put his hand in his breast pocket and produced a flat folded paper parcel from which he took out with much care a little odd-looking newspaper you are to understand master davy he said as we have left the bush now, being so well to do, and have gone right way round to Port Middle Bay Harbour, where there's what we call a town. Uh, Mr. Micawber was in the bush near you, said I. Oh, bless you, yes, said Mr. Peggotty, and turned to with a will. I never wish to meet a greater gentleman for turning to with a will. I've seen that there bald head of his a perspiring in the sun, Master Davy, till I almost thought it would have melted away. And now he's a magistrate. "'A magistrate, eh?' said I. Mr. Peggotty pointed to a certain paragraph in the newspaper, where I read aloud as followed from the Port Middle Bay Times. "'The public dinner to our distinguished fellow colonist and townsman, Wilkins Micawber, Esquire, Port Middle Bay District Magistrate, came off yesterday in the large room of the hotel, which was crowded to suffocation. It is estimated that not fewer than forty-seven persons must have been accommodated with dinner at one time, exclusive of the company in the passage and on the stairs. The beauty, fashion, and exclusiveness of Port Middle Bay flocked to do honour to one so deservedly esteemed, so highly talented, and so widely popular. Dr. Mell of Colonial Salem House Grammar School, Port Middle Bay, presided, and on his right sat the distinguished guest. After the removal of the cloth and the singing of Non Nobis, beautifully executed, and in which we were at no loss to distinguish the bell-like notes of that gifted amateur, Wilkins Micawber, Esquire, Junior, the usual loyal and patriotic toasts were severally given and rapturously received. Dr. Mell, in a speech replete with feeling, then proposed our distinguished guest, the ornament of our town may he never leave us but to better himself and may his success among us be such as to render his bettering himself impossible the cheering with which the toast was received defies description again and again it rose and fell like the waves of ocean at length all was hushed and wilkins micawber esq presented himself to return thanks far be it from us in the present comparatively imperfect state of the resources of our establishment to endeavour to follow our distinguished townsman through the smoothly flowing periods of his polished and highly ornate address suffice it to observe that it was a masterpiece of eloquence and that those passages in which he more particularly traced his own successful career to its source and warned the younger portion of his auditory from the shoals of ever incurring pecuniary liabilities which they were unable to liquidate brought a tear into the manliest eye present the remaining toasts were dr mell mrs micawber who gracefully bowed her acknowledgments from the side door where a galaxy of beauty was elevated on chairs at once to witness and adore the gratifying scene mrs bridger beggs late miss micawber mrs mell wilkins micawber esq junior who convulsed the assembly by humorously remarking that he found himself unable to return thanks in speech but would do so with their permission in a song mrs micawber's family well known it is needless to remark in the mother country etc 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 at the conclusion of the proceedings the tables were cleared as if by art magic for dancing among the votaries of terpsichore who disported themselves until sol gave warning for departure wilkins micawber esq junior and the lovely and accomplished miss helena fourth daughter of dr mell were particularly remarkable I was looking back to the name of Dr. Mell, pleased to have discovered in these happier circumstances Mr. Mell, formerly poor pinched usher to my Middlesex magistrate, when Mr. Peggotty, pointing to another part of the paper, my eyes rested on my own name, and I read thus. To David Copperfield, Esquire, the eminent author. My dear sir, 
Years have elapsed since I have had an opportunity of ocularly perusing the lineaments now familiar to the imaginations of a considerable portion of the civilized world. But, my dear sir, though estranged by the force of circumstances over which I have had no control, from the personal society of the friend and companion of my youth, I have not been unmindful of his soaring flight, nor have I been debarred, though seas between us braid her roared. Burns, from participating in the intellectual feasts he has spread before us. I cannot, therefore, allow of the departure from this place of an individual whom we mutually respect and esteem, without, my dear sir, taking this public opportunity of thanking you on my own behalf, and, I may undertake to add, on that of the whole of the inhabitants of Port Middlebay, for the gratification of which you are the ministering agent. Go on, my dear sir, you are not unknown here, you are not unappreciated. Though remote, we are neither unfriended, melancholy, nor, I may add, slow. Go on, my dear sir, in your eagle course. The inhabitants of Port Middlebay may at least aspire to watch it with delight, with entertainment, with instruction. Among the eyes elevated towards you from this portion of the globe will ever be found, while it has light and life, the eye appertaining to Wilkins Micawber magistrate i found on glancing at the remaining content of the newspaper that mr micawber was a diligent and esteemed correspondent of that journal there was another letter from him in the same paper touching a bridge there was an advertisement of a collection of similar letters by him to be shortly republished in a neat volume with considerable additions and unless i am very much mistaken the leading article was also his we talked much of Mr. Micawber on many other evenings while Mr. Peggotty remained with us. He lived with us during the whole term of his stay, which I think was something less than a month, and his sister and my aunt came to London to see him. Agnes and I parted from him aboard ship when he sailed, and we shall never part from him more on earth. But before he left he went with me to Yarmouth to see a little tablet I had put up in the churchyard to the memory of Ham. While I was copying the plain inscription for him at his request, I saw him stoop and gather a tuft of grass from the grave and a little earth. "'For Emily,' he said, as he put it in his breast, "'I promised, Master Davy.'" End of chapter 63